Let's give it up for Mr. Tom Windish and Naya. <laughs> So Naya, tell us a little bit about how you got started. I understand you have a pretty strong musical background, but um, yeah. you were kind of like a piano geek growing up? Yeah, I, I mean, my mom was a pianist, so we kind of all had to play piano growing up, which I'm very thankful for now. Um, and as I you know, developed my piano skills, I started singing and really just wanted to figure out how to be the best at singing and just dove right into it and you know tried to go to all the right summer camps and my mom was the one who encouraged me to apply to young arts so and then ever since then just kept going <laughs> and uh, what college did you go you went to new school new school the jazz contemporary music program for jazz voice so you had pretty much a clear defining career path that you wanted to do this professionally yeah i did um, when I was younger, I just loved music. And then I think when I came to Young Arts, I realized that I might be good enough to make it into a career, so, which, is a, which is a big undertaking. But So when you were kind of doing the gigging and stuff, did you heard about the Windish Agency or? No, I, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really understand that there was a music industry or a whole system that was set up to supporting artists on, on a career level. So I just kind of focused on the craft and you know studying voice. And then once I understood there was this whole world of how you you know can be a professional artist and make money and start a brand and kind of create your own empire in a way. You know I wanted to work with the best people and find people that really could nurture my talent and help develop the right route for me. And Tom, you were mentioning earlier that you also play piano, too. Uh, that, that's an overstatement at this, <laughs> at this point. Yeah, of course. Oh. Um, my, I started playing piano um, when I was like four or five years old. My mom was a piano teacher. My grandmother and great aunt were all piano teachers. Um, and there was always piano in, playing in my house. Um, so yeah, I played too. I played through college. Uh, I'm not very good anymore. And what was your favorite pianist growing up? Oh God, I don't. I mean, I played like classical piano. You know. oh. But you were also like in a band. I mean, you, you were definitely in the music biz early stages, I guess. Um, I mean, like I'll give my short story. Um, I. Uh, always obsessed with like music and I started a lawn mowing business when I was in seventh grade for the, the neighbor you know and uh, that business uh, I ended up mowing about 50 lawns a week and employed three people including one who had a driver's license um, the whole time I was listening to my Walkman um, and wasn't really like obsessed with music that much when I started but after like a couple months of walking around with like the same three tapes playing, you know, what, go, what were those three tapes, by the way? Oh man, you're going deep. I, I mean, <laughs> the audience wants going to know. deep early. <laughs> it was like U2 and uh, REM, Camper Van Beethoven, um, and a bunch of other stuff. And then it would get, get more and more obscure. By the time I was in ninth grade, I was into some, you know, kind of weird stuff. And um, when when I went to, uh, I started DJing at like high school parties and stuff with tapes, Whoa. which is a pain Do in the Do you guys neck. know tapes out there, <laughs> cassette tapes? Um, that was What's a pain. That? And um, then when I went to college, I got into radio. Um, met a guy at the orientation, and he's like, oh, you like music? I like music. What, what bands do you like? Oh, I like those bands. We should join the radio station. Cool. And like three weeks later, we were like doing the radio station, and I, was obs I became obsessed with that um, right away. I, I would volunteer for all the shifts in the middle of the night when nobody else would, they would just turn the station off or I would go and do it, and I would just go into this, these um, closets of records um, and just experiment and play, play whatever the heck, you know, even if it had a cool album cover or something, I would play it. Um, and I, I, I got so lucky like throughout my entire career. So that happened. Then this guy uh, came and said, hey, 
I put on like this concert for the radio station at the end of the year. Um, I'm going to drop out of college um, and, and uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, would you like me to teach you how to do it? And then you put that on that show, and then you have to do it next semester. And I was like, that sounds cool. <laughs> and I did it. It was pr pretty easy, and I loved it. Um, so I did a bunch of shows, and uh, like my when I was a sophomore. Wait, can I ask your first booking? It's a band called the the Feelies. The Feelies. Anybody? Still one oh, of my okay. one of my favorite bands. Um, it was it was amazing. Uh, it was the bass player's birthday. We brought oh. a cake out on stage. Thousand kids. Last day of classes. It was it was great. Um, and then a sophomore, I booked a couple shows and. Uh, this guy came to me and said, uh, you know, last year the, the college brought Meatloaf for like their big end of year school show, and the year before they brought Meatloaf too. Um, <laughs> I'm in charge of um, like choosing whoever puts on the concerts here. The only two shows I want to go to are the ones that you have coming up. Would you like to be in charge of the whole thing? And I was like, yeah. And I booked like 50 shows when I was a sophomore. Um, I booked Cypress Hill, Sonic Youth, Dinosaur Jr., Super Chunk, uh, Jonathan Richmond, Billy Bragg. Uh, the list like went on and on and on. I went to school in upstate New York. Um, I would get these bands to come and play during lunchtime on their way out of New York to go to like Cleveland or something. And I, and I'd, I did a ton of stuff. And when I was a junior, um, I got an internship at William Morris. Um, and that's when I figured out I want to be an agent. I got fired from William Morris three weeks after I started. Uh, they said I was not William Morris material. Um, and I started booking bands um, wow. then, uh, while I was in college. And uh, I did that for three years. My company was called Bug Booking. I called it that because I had to bug people to book the bands. Um, and the only bands that would work with me were ones that no other agency would work with. I was like the bottom of the totem pole. Um, did that for about three years. It was really, really broke. Um, this was back before the internet, and it was all phone. The phone bill was like insane. And, um, and then I eventually joined another agency called Billions in Chicago, which was very credible. They were booking Pavement and Don John Spencer and a bunch of cool bands. Chicago was an amazing music city at, at that time. Um, and I, I was the second person to work there. I built up a roster of about 50 bands. Um, and then eight years later, I quit and started the Windish Agency in my apartment with those 50 bands. And then it, and then it grew. And as they say, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. um, so with all that being said, I mean, Windish has really taken on this kind of a aesthetic. I mean, it's not, you were earlier saying it's not like you're booking Katy Perry and you know Justin Bieber, but it's also not doing country or like the crazy like commercial hip hop. It has this really like uber cool, edgy bands, musicians, what whatever you call it. How do you think you got that aesthetic? I mean, it, at this point, it's like that's when you say, oh, it's a windish artist. Like we automatically know what that means. Um, I book bands I like. Uh, and I, I like things that are a little bit different than anything I've ever heard before. Um, the, the second band I ever booked is called Low. Um, I don't know how many people know them. I still book them, actually, after 23 years. And uh, they're very, very slow. Have you heard them? Um, they're, slow, they're, low. they're pretty amazing. They sound like angels or something when they sing. Um, but I heard that, and I was like, I, uh, I have to book this. Um, and. I kind of just approach it the same way um, these days. If I love it, um, and it, I love stuff that sounds kind of weird, not not the same, then then I want to do it. And you know, I guess that stuff is kind of cool. So are you saying nice music is weird? <laughs> I think it's a, a little. It's unique. You know, there's nothing else like it. Um, so yeah, I mean. Um, M the music business is a relationship business, and the way we were introduced uh, is not from like me just getting like an email randomly saying check this out. I get a lot of those, um, but I got an email from um, a friend of mine um, who I've known for like 20 years. This is probably like s four, four years ago or something, and she was like, um, "I want you to check this out." 
Um, I, you know, I think you're really gonna like it. I'm managing it. Uh, I don't manage many things. Um, I'd worked with her forever and uh, let me know what you think. And I played it and I was like, this is amazing. And I p called her up immediately. I was like, what's the, what's the deal? So handing it to Naya, I don't know, the, is the mic doesn't work, but um, um, yeah. But so in, when you were saying, you know, going back to the aesthetic, what, is, what, what can you describe about your music? Why do you feel your music fits with kind of the Windish brand? Well, I think it's kind of a, there's a bit of a twist on classic music, you know, and finding those artists that kind of have their own thing going on is really important. You know, all artists, I think, have references that inspire them and who they kind of always wanted to be like. And, but you have to kind of make it your own or it ends up just feeling like copies of other things. So, and you know, I studied jazz voice and then when I started writing my own music, I kind of tried to pull the references of what's important to me and then create my own kind of palette of colors and sounds and you know, the way I want to sing. And hopefully that translated and it obviously did and people started to respond, so. And I think, you know, being cool doesn't necessarily mean like you can't sing jazz too, you know? Like there's a whole discrepancy of like what's cool musically, but I think that's what's great about Tom. He could identify whichever genre musically an artist is if it's something special and if they're authentic enough. Yeah, but we were earlier discussing about how there's so much cool music out there, but how does that one type of artist break out into kind of the mainstream? Yeah. And once that happens, are, are they not cool anymore? I mean. I think it's, I don't know. I think if you're cool, you're just cool. And most people that are cool don't even know they're cool. You know, it's, it's not about being cool. It's about being good at what you do, I think. And like, that's how I think, I don't know. Maybe I was never cool. I think you're pretty cool. I think everyone's but. pretty cool here. But Tom, for you, like how, how do you kind of identify these artists and also hold their integrity so they're not like, again, like, you know, pimping themselves out on like NBC's The Voice or that kind of stuff. Like, I mean, the way the way I find out about them is through relationships with people. Um, it, it it really comes down to that. It, and I think it's really important for aspiring musicians and aspiring um, music business people to really realize that um, I've spent an enor enormous amount of time um, nurturing nurturing relationships. Um, every day I spend about an hour reaching out to people and sometimes they're brand new people, other times it's people I've worked with for a long, long time and just finding out what's going on and trying to have a two-way relationship where I'm telling them about things that I'm hearing about and they're telling me about things that they're hearing about and that's how I hear about bands. And then, you know, the other thing is I, I, you know, I work with a lot of bands. Um, I work very hard um, and the people that I work with you know, appreciate the work I do, and they call me about something else. Um, so like Dana, her manager, she knew if I said, I really love this, um, I really want to do this, and here's what I would do, that like, I will stand behind that. Right. I mean, and one kind of um, side note was that you were mentioning nowadays, you know, artists, they break out because of the internet or, you know, there's some crazy buzz on YouTube that they barely have a live set. But your business is live bookings. I mean, how do you kind of take that risk on? Like Lord, you mentioned, for example, was one that, I mean, that was a huge breakout success, but that could have been a huge flop, right? If she sucked live. Um, it, the Lord story is kind of cool. Um, I was out at a like an event in New York, and my friend said, you gotta go meet this woman, uh, she's really cool, she knows about a lot, of, a lot of cool bands, she's doing this thing in New York tonight. Uh, so I went and I met her, uh, we talked a lot about music for a little bit, and then at the end she said, uh, check out this, uh, this girl named Lord. So I email it to myself, almost every night I email this stuff to myself, like something someone tells me about. I went home that night, there was one song on SoundCloud, it was, uh, it was Royals. I played it, and uh, I was like, this is great. Uh, so I wrote to the manager uh, and said, you know, hey, I heard this. This is really great. Let's, uh, you want to have a conversation about what's going on? Um, but here's the second cool part. Um, he was in New Zealand. He shared an office um, with another manager who I had worked with for about 
seven or eight years. Uh-huh. Um, and I really like, you know, took care, I did good work with that guy. So he kind of chatted across the office, hey, you know this guy, Tom Windish? Um, he wants to book Lord. Uh, what do you think? And he was like, he's great. Uh, that's perfect. So he wrote back like two days later uh, and was like, let's do it. I mean, we had like one call. And she only had one song. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's like, it's another one of the tangents we could go down. But uh, um, yeah, back in the day. Um, right. Um, back in cassette tape days, yeah. Back in the day, bands would come to me who had already booked themselves their own tours for many, many years. Uh, and they would literally tell me, like, here's who to call. Here's how much we got paid. Get us a little more money, and then we don't have to deal with it, and, and like, you pay for yourself. And like, okay, cool. That, that like, has gone away pretty much completely now. Um, now I deal with people who, like, don't know what it's like much at all to book a show. Um, and uh, I mean, even fast forward even more, I go after bands who haven't even played shows, um, which sounds counterintuitive, uh, I know. I remember about 10 years ago, I was speaking somewhere with another like, very veteran agent, and someone asked, asked me, uh, would you book a band that you haven't seen? And I was like, absolutely. Um, like I, I booked this band called Jaga Jazzist. Um, I booked. I said yes to book them. I'd never seen them, but <coughs> but um, I was broke. A, the music was amazing. Um, my friends who I had worked with for a long time uh, were like working with them. I called my other friends in Norway and I said, "Have you seen this band? Are they good?" This was like maybe it was 15 years ago, before like YouTube and stuff. And uh, you know, everyone was like, "They're great. They're great. They're great." And I loved it. And I was like, of course, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to fly to Norway like next week. Because um, I can't even like pay the rent, um, so I said yes, and they came over to the United States. They did a really successful tour, and they were like mind-blowingly awesome, you know. Um, so I kind of learned like way back when, I take chances, you know. Um, and when people I'm friends with and I trust tell me like something's good, you know, most of the time they're right. Um, and if it's not, if they're not, like musicians also have a way of working things out. Um, so now these days. I book bands that uh, haven't played, haven't even played a show. Um, it's kind of the nature, like the nature of the market. Like I would love it if they had an amazing show all worked out, um, but there are other agencies who do this. Um, <laughs> they're they're like sharks circling around me, and uh, yeah. they tend to like try to book these bands like a couple months after I hear about them. Um, and if that means I have to sign something before it's played a show, like you know, Lord hadn't, and and that worked out. Um, so I'll do that all day long if I need to, and and I even like ha- work with them to help them, at least get them sh- get them like gigs that are not really um, where like tastemakers aren't going to be and bloggers and in industry. So like if from uh, if you're from LA, I might say like you know go rehearse someplace for a while, but why don't you go get your feet wet and play in San Diego, um, and you know Pitchfork's not going to write about it, or go play in Orange County. And we won't tell anyone about it, but just go and like get your like stage legs a little bit, you know. Um, and we do a lot of that nowadays. Nia, did you play in Orange County? Mm-hmm. No, but I played some some my first shows, uh, kind of off the beaten path, just to make sure it was all working out, which I think is important. And also, yeah. like to curate it right, which is what he's starting to do for me. Just kind of know where's the right venues for me to play and pretty much help develop my live show, which I think is is how it works now. You know, you kind of curate these bands and artists of where they should go and what's the the route and how to get there. So So we were just saying too about how social media has really kind of taken the charge of what gets signed or booked and that sort of thing. And um, I helped Naya today Snapchat. So just saying follow Naya on Snapchat, right? We're supposed to do that, right? Follow for follow. Um, but h- how, I mean, how much pressure is that, that you're here, you know, people are judging you by how many followers you have on your Instagram account, yet, you know, you were saying they could barely hold a note, I mean. I mean, personally, it, it can f- be very frustrating, also because, you know, I'm an NFAA winner. <laughs> I went to music school, and then I see some artists that 
you know, blow up and they, you know, I, I don't understand why it's happening, but I think <laughs> as Not I... Not a lot of people do sometimes. <laughs> as I try to, like, adapt and understand how it all works, they have something that I just don't have, you know? They have other qualities that I'm realizing are just as vital, you know? And I come from an older generation of understanding the craft, really trying to be the best at what you do. And now there's a whole nother skill set that I've realized some of these younger artists have that I don't. And it's about, you know, creating these relationships, exposing themselves and having these communities. And, you know, ultimately that's how people find these artists now is, is through these socials, you know? And I think I felt nervous because I alienated myself from it and was very isolated. And now I'm trying to find my way in it and how it feels comfortable for me. So. I'm, I'm, I'm warming up to the Snapchat. I, mean, the, I, I don't really pay attention to any of those numbers. Yeah. Um, and, really? And you thank really? God. Are yeah. you God. sure? Yeah, and it goes back to like the be beginning of my career. Um, back then, the number was SoundScan. How many records have they sold in each market? And the clubs would say, how many records have they sold in Kansas City? And like, 100. OK, well, we'll give you like uh, 200 bucks or something. And my bands didn't really sell any records because um, they were all on these independent labels and radio stations didn't play them. Um, so it, and numbers meant nothing. You know, like they sold a thousand records, seven in Seattle or whatever. I don't know. Um, I don't really care. I care about like, and what I think musicians should care about today more than ever, make great music, be authentic. The more real you are, um, the better your chance of success. The, uh, the audience, the world, the, fa the fans can like, sense like, when things are inauthentic and when it's manufactured. Um, and yes, some people might get ahead who are, who are manufactured, but I, don't, I wouldn't like, place money on them having as much staying power as people who are genuinely doing this because uh, they love it, they have talent. Um, they work with other very talented people. Um, like she doesn't really have to worry about S Snapchat as much as her manager, <laughs> and her, and the people who do marketing uh, for her and her label or publicity company or whatever. Yeah. So that brings up a good point. How important is your team in regards to manager, publicist, agent? I mean, nowadays it seems like you could do it all by yourself, or or you could you might need a I think squad. It's unbelievably important. I mean, it, it sounds like I just had this perfect manager that knew Tom Windish, but it took years to find the right team for me and the right people that really understood my vision because it took me years to figure out what my vision even was, like what I was trying to accomplish with my own music and you know, trying to express that to someone who then can market it and manage it and understand how to guide me. It took a very long time, and you know, I tried a couple of managers before I found uh, my current manager. And you know, you just have to try things and make mistakes and figure out who works for you. And I mean, the team is is you know vital. And I don't think you can do it by yourself. I mean, the artist, it's their job to make the music, and then it's finding the right team that can really take you to the the next level. It's it's huge. I mean, she was talking about like the sh shows before. Um, the shows, I, I think that, and I don't know if all all agents feel this way. I guess they probably say they do. But uh, the shows that you do are incredibly important to like developing the brand or the the type of uh, following that the artist has, the way the world perceives them. So I pay a lot of attention. Like there's certain clubs that are like kind of cool, and if the artist is trying to be kind of cool, then they play there. And if they want to be kind of cool in a slightly different way, there's another club. Um, there's also like ticket prices and what other bands they play with and how the ad looks and like where the ads are placed and where there's posters and all that kind of stuff. And we pay a lot of attention to that from day one to like to where Lord's at. Um, and I'm always trying to throw like weird curveballs in um, that make the audience really, really excited. Like Lord played at a cemetery in LA. Um, where tons of famous people are buried, and it and it was like people were jumping over the walls to get in, um, and like that's an example of something a booking agent can do to like create a lightning rod for getting getting fans really really excited. All this other stuff, like 
all bands have like some things that they can say like, well, I have this. Like, I have tons of fans on Snapchat. Spin said I was like the top ten band to watch. Um, NPR played me. KCRW has played me. We did this live thing on this TV show. What I had, our company has 650 clients, and they all have 10 to 15 things on the artist page on our website, each of them, of like really cool things that they've done. And that's just ours, you know. And then we have these partners that have other bands, 2,000, you know, 1,500 other bands. They all have really cool things going on too. So. You know, you could have lots of Snapchat followers, but not very many um, Twitter followers, like whatever. Just, you gotta try to do all that stuff well. The biggest thing is make great music um, and play great shows. And I think don't compare yourself to how much other people are making or where other people are on the bill um, or, or necessarily what your slot is or something. Like just go, 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 be happy. <laughs> pinch yourself once in a while, like, this is pretty freaking cool, you know? I feel like one of the luckiest guys in the world. I work with geniuses, and, and I'm in a really amazing position um, that I can help them a lot. Um, and I've built a company, of, there's 80 other people at my company who all feel the same way. Um, it's really, really cool. And I tell them the three principles we have are book bands that you like, return every email immediately, and be nice to people. We've been doing that. Yeah, <laughs> kudos to that. That deserves a round of applause. When my, my competitors ask me, like, you know, what, how, how did you do this? And, and I tell them that, and like their eyes kind of gloss over that. And, and what else, like, that's it. No, it's really funny, I, I mean, I, I, for those that know me, I used to be the programs director at the Arsh Center. And I always remembered, like, you know, looking at Windish's roster and be like, oh, I want to book this guy and book. So I would, like, write these, like, really poetic emails to Tom Windish. And I'm like, immediately, this guy would always respond, regardless if it's, like, one word or, you know. But I, I always thought that was, like, indicative of why you're successful today, because you really took the time to just to respond and be nice. And so, yeah, no, this guy's the real deal, as I said, an OG. Original gangster. I mean, another thing is the relationship thing. I, I can't tell you how important that is. Um, but one of the first things I did when I started Windish was actually go to London for six weeks. And I made a list of 150 people that I wanted to meet um, that I respected. And it was some of the people were running like the biggest record companies in, in the world. Um, other people were like booking clubs, like big clubs, tiny clubs. Um, this one guy I met had put out five seven inches, uh, and each of those seven inches I loved. Um, didn't book any of the bands, but I was like, this is a really cool kid. He was like 19, I'd heard about him someplace. Um, this is back in dial up internet days, I remember. That was, yeah. ugh, it was crazy. Um, but I went and met him, and we had a great talk about music and all, all this stuff, uh, what inspires us and everything. At the end of the meeting, he handed me a CD. And he said, uh, I haven't given this to any other agents yet, um, but it's a band I'm managing. They're called the XX. Wow. I think they're going to be the biggest band in the world. And I took it home and listened to it that night. And I uh, called him up the next day. And I was like, let's go meet again. So there you go. Take meetings. Um, so without further ado, I want to really open up the, the form because I know um, I was mentioning earlier, this salon is slightly different. We definitely want to get a dialogue going. So um, I know there's a lot of aspiring musicians out there and potential bookers or we have two of the, the best up here to kind of take on your questions. So anybody? Wanna, ooh, the, this man in the front right here. Did everyone hear that question or no? It's like basically how, how do you book more shows in Miami? <laughs> I've got, I, I remember I did an interview for like a paper here once about that. Um, it's hard, like I, I book a lot of bands that are from other countries um, and, and they'll say to me, okay, we're gonna come to the United States for three weeks. Um, we have all these costs. Um, they usually like lose money on on tours year after year. And at some point, you know, it it like changes. Um, and usually, when the, at the point when it changes, they start having kids and saying like the tour's shorter now. 
uh, or we're going to do two trips, you know, that are that are shorter. Um, I mean, ge geographically, like this is in a weird place uh, and it's far. Um, and I have bands that don't like go to Atlanta, you know, or North Carolina or even Texas, like on their first or sometimes even second tour. You know, they go to New York and L.A. and Chicago and San Francisco and they'll do like kind of eight big, big cities. Um, it and what I do like kind of varies from band to band to band. Um, and and a lot of it has to do with what they're willing to do and what they like the amount of time that they give me and how much they'll say that they'll play for. You know, I mean, I could tell them like it would be awesome if you went and did this and that and that. And it's not just Miami. It's like a lot of places um, like Mexico City, for instance. <laughs> I'll have like huge offers to go there, and the bands are just like, yeah, we, we don't feel like adding uh, three more days on. Um, that's cool. Um, or like Sao Paulo, um, where there are like a ton of people that want to see this. There's not even like a very big audience here. Plus, there's not that many venues to play. Um, but I mean, we, we do tons of stuff here. We, we also book tons of electronic acts and DJ stuff, but um, electronic things that come here. We book bands here sometimes. Um, it's unfortunate that Grand Central isn't here because we did a ton of business with them. Um, the fact that there's like a booker who returns my calls, loves the bands that I'm calling them about, and like works out a deal with me like quickly is really helpful. You know, uh, Sonopoly has done like great things for this market too. You know, like a festival or like larger events, the budgets are a little bit bigger and you can like get an act, like justify getting an act down here. Um, a lot of those roadblocks, though, like don't have to do with the agent. Just like um, having their like blinders on, it has to do with the artists and the team around the artists, and they're being pulled in directions all over the world, and c only want to play so many shows. I, I wanted to know. I see uh, there's like a lot of you know agents that are growing such a big roster so fast because you know there's so many artists co um, converting and becoming bigger, and sometimes I feel like some of the agents take on more than what they can actually, um, you know, more than they can handle. If you have an artist, or if you're an artist and you're stuck in that situation where you, you, you got with one of the big agencies and you're there, but then you kind of find yourself at the bottom of the, the roster where, you know, there's priority above them, what would you say to an artist in that situation? I'm not an artist in that situation, but I'm asking that question, like, um, what, 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 any advice in that scenario? Um, yeah, I mean, I, sometimes, you know, I'm trying to sign a band and they go to another agency or to a, like a specific person and I know that I would provide a better service than that person would or that the agent at my company who's going after would provide a better service. Other times, like, I'm not so sure. Um, I mean, if you're at an agency and feel like you're not getting um, treated well, then change agencies. It's pretty easy. There's no contracts in our business. It's a handshake all across the board. Uh, so you can change at any time and you know once in a while people leave our agency because they don't feel like they're getting the right service or attention or whatever um, and I guess another thing that as musicians or aspiring musicians should pay attention to is that there's a lot of promises in this business that are not kept um, try to see through the smoke and mirrors a lot um, you know when they tell you that they're gonna make your movie star and and you haven't even like uh, played New York, like maybe, maybe that's not true. Um, and to go back to your making great music, playing great shows kind of philosophy and see what happens. Naya, you were mentioning that earlier before we got up here how hard it is to, <laughs> to really be an artist. Um, so please explain <laughs> a little more to it our audience. It is really hard. I mean, that question also, like I've been, uh, in places where I was not acknowledged the same way. And that's also to the point of finding the right people that do get what you want to do and can help you build it. You know, no one should kind of change what you're doing. They should try to enhance it and improve it in a way. So, but it's really hard, you know, it's, everything's hard if you want to be good at it. So it's, you just got to stick with it and, you know, also make noise so your agency notices you more. You know, there's lots of things we can do now as artists and to get press or to, you know, make some noise so your agency starts to spend more attention and time with you, you know, it's it's really in your hands and that's why, 
you know, you just got to keep working at it and like stay really determined and not look at everyone else's Instagram to see what they're doing and just like stay on your track. <laughs> it is a it, it is a really funky time to me. Um, there's a lot. There's so much going on. There's so much music happening. So many festivals. So much press. So it's like so much content. It's I don't know how people keep keep up. Um, I wish a, uh, artists would be patient and slow down. Um, it's, and it's one of the things I tell the artists that I sign um, very early on, like let's slow down and figure out what, um, what, what the plan is for the next year, year and a half, two years. Because um, often like I, I'll find I'm going after an artist, maybe they have half a million plays of one song on SoundCloud or Spotify or a million or two million, whatever. And like all this stuff's happening, like Lee R. Cohen, a very powerful label guy, is calling him, and and uh, you know all these people are calling Jay Z and and so and so producer and this label that and this agency that agency this manager, you know, and you know all this stuff's happening. Some satellite radios playing it, whatever, and they and we we get them, you know, we sign them, and they're like, all right, now what? Like I'm like, well, let's let's slow down. Um, you don't have to go do like every festival right now. You don't have to go on tour with the biggest band in the world right now. Let's go play some cool shows. Let's sell them out, turn some people away, um, and start planning for what we're going to do after that. Um, I was like talking to a band a couple months ago, which, I mean, we hadn't even signed them, and they emailed me like the, that night, and they're like, so what are the chances you could get us on Coachella if we do this? <laughs> Coachella was like two months later. I'm planning Coachella 2017 right now. Um, things book like a year in advance, um, big, the big festivals do. And I was like just immediately turned off, like uh, this isn't going to work out. Esther can vouch for me that I work, with, I work with some pretty cool talent, and one of them is another Young Arts winner and a wonderful, talented person who's now, I think, finally finding his voice. He's uh, last year at Berkeley, and he doing some testosterone rock, which is not exactly what he was doing when he was at Young Arts, but they're really doing really authentic stuff. Do you think it's too early before a band has done their first album to bring somebody to you? Or do you think th they, th they should be really baked? Or I think you just answered that. Um, I mean, yeah, I think it's probably too early. Um. I don't know, like, I don't know what I would do, really. I, I've gotten involved, I get involved early. Um, sometimes too early. Um, and I'll be sitting there for many years, and there's not much I can, can do. You know, I can, like, put bands on shows, and I can, I can sometimes squeeze bands on festivals and, and do that kind of thing. But if I do that, like, ten times, and nothing's really happening, like, those people don't do it again for me. Um, and then when it's actually time to go, so like, all right, we have a record out. We're like, we're really ready. You got to go do that stuff again anyway. Uh, so I tell bands, like, let's not start until we're ready to, like, hit the gas and go for, like, the next two or three years and really have that kind of plan of how this is going to work out. Um, otherwise, you're just kind of, like, spinning your wheels or, act, or like, just wasting time, wasting money, anno like, um, annoying people. Because going playing shows that, like, no one's really at or uh, like no one says anything about, like, oh, that, who was that band? They were like, meh. Um, doesn't really do you any favors, you know? It kind of hurts. Um, so yeah, wait until it's like really ready. So I'm just curious, um, let's say I'm an artist, or let's say we're artists who are not sure whether they want to sign, have an agent, um, and then just both of you persuade us why we should. Is literally like tell us what you do, Tom, and like what Tom does, Naya, as literally as possible. Just wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> why why you should sign with a booking agency? Yeah, okay. just okay. how does it work? Well, <laughs> do you want to call clubs and get? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean. It's really hard for like an artist to call up a venue and get shows, um, to get lots of shows. I, it's, I, I just talked to an artist the other day who, for the first time in quite a long time, like she had been booking her own shows, uh, which I had enormous respect for. Oh my God, like, you get it. <laughs> you've, been, you've been there. It's a pain in the neck. Um, it's a lot easier for me, though. 
It's yeah. so much easier because uh, when I write to these people, they write me back like like that, and when she writes to them, they don't. <laughs> Um, and when I say, like, what's the biggest show you have where there's not an opening band yet, um, put this band on, they do. And when she says that, they don't. Because <laughs> I've said that to them, like, you know, I do like 100 shows a year with these people, maybe more. Um, they trust me. Yeah. And they'll try to help. And also from the artist's perspective, when you find the right booking agent or agency, he books me the shows that make sense for me. Meaning like my music, you don't really want to smell cheap beer when you listen to my music. Like, and he'll, he'll not put me in these rock venues. You know, he kind of picks the right environment where my music could be the, you know, better received. You know, it's not just, I'm out there playing all these shows and nobody's really engaged because it, the environment's not right. So he really takes the time to curate what's the right venue and the right situation for me, so. I encourage you to do it as long as you possibly can, and uh, you'll figure out why it's great to have an agent. I guess my question could go to either one of you. Um, what would you suggest would be the best way to approach a booking agency? Because uh, I've worked with, uh, I guess I've worked with Aramis, um, I've worked with David, I've worked with Jacob. The best shows I've ever played was actually with your artists. I played with Mac DeMarco on No More Orchestra. Um, I went on the Florida tour of Matt and Kim, and those were the best shows I ever played. So my question is, how would you suggest, if, if, even if it's Windish or if it's another booking agency, how would you suggest it's the best way for an artist or anyone in music to approach? Because you know, it's, it's really important, I think. You know, a, I think a booker is probably the most important thing of a band, you know? Ba I mean, basically, like the way Naya's manager did, like go through a person that has a relationship with an, agent, with an agency or agent that you really respect, and, like develop a relationship with that person, like work with that person in some way. And it could be a publicist, a lawyer, a manager, a label. It doesn't have to be like a manager. It could be any variety of people. Did I say lawyer? Um, <laughs> uh, like, and that person like calling me goes a lot, lot farther than uh, than like you reaching out to me. No offense. Um, I mean, people reach out to me constantly. Um, I really haven't like picked up almost anything that I just kind of got unsolicited. Um, I think maybe a couple times I have, and it, it didn't, it never worked out. Uh, it, there's a lot more pieces of the puzzle that are required than a good agent when it comes down to it. You know, like I can book some cool shows, but you need to have like the social media thing happening. You need to have like not only music coming out, but it being like strategically released and like getting out to as many people as possible. People t telling radio to play it, like all, all the press, you know, all that stuff needs to be happening um, kind of together. Um, for things to really work. Um, I mean, and like having someone like Aramis or a promoter call me, that's a good way. I call promoters and ask them like, what's going, who's kind of popping off in your city or blowing up, what do you like? Um, I call them a lot. But, you know, like Aramis has asked me to like check things out that I haven't done, you know? Like it, it's not just a sure thing that I'm gonna do it because so, someone says, you know, check that, this out, this is awesome kind of comes down to our, our personal taste too. I'll forward it to like 100 agents at our, at our agencies. Um, like last year we partnered with this, this agency, Paradigm, and they own another agency called AM Only and another one called Coda. And there's about 125 agents um, collectively and everything that comes in, I forward all of them. Um, most of the time they don't really say anything. Um, I think I'm like more open than most of them about like just checking new things out and taking chances and picking up the phone and trying to figure out what's happening. But yeah, have someone else call. <laughs> Hi, um, I work in marketing and event production and wondered if you booked talent for private events. Yeah, totally, we love it. Awesome. <laughs> Especially when, you know, it's well paid. That was easy. Oh, we have a question back here. Hi, so you've talked a lot about relationships and how important those are to build. How, how important is geography to creating relationships with the type of people that you're gonna listen to when they give you a recommendation? I personally 
I, I don't think it matters because now you have the internet, you know, and I, mean, I didn't just wake up and find this manager, you know, I reach out to some of the producers I'm working with on Twitter, you know, like a lot of my relationships have happened online, you know, and you just, you never know, you just ask and see who's interested in, you know, hearing what you have to say, so. Yeah, what do you know. mean, what do you, I don't know, what, explain more. So you discussed about relationships and how you heard about Naya through somebody who you've had a relationship for a long time. Are those people primarily centered in LA, New York, Nashville? If you're an artist who's kicking ass in Miami like he is, then you might not be creating those relationships or getting seen by those people. Is that possible? And if so, would you recommend bands to move to those type of cities? Mm, maybe. Um. I mean, I book bands from Norway, Sweden, Australia, Brazil, uh, Mexico, LA, New York, Chicago. You know, her manager I know from Chicago. Um, I used to be roommates with her partner. Um, yeah, I mean, I moved to LA from Chicago because I realized like there's a lot of business stuff going on here that I'm missing out on. Um, but I'm also really glad that I lived in Chicago for 15 years and kind of figured out what it meant to be an agent and, and how I wanted to be an agent. And I'm glad I wasn't in like the, the shark infested waters of LA at that time. I think it would have been really depressing and demoralizing. I remember in the very beginning, um, I was in New York um, when I had the bug booking thing and I, I, I it was really like a bummer, you know. People would say like, "Who do you book?" Like, like I never heard of those bands. Like, um, and that just kind of sucked. I was like a twenty-year-old kid um, with no money and didn't really know even how to do this like job thing. Um, it was barely a job. So, th and I moved to Chicago, and it was awesome. There were all these like musicians and like independent business music business people. They were like, "Oh, cool, yeah." Like, call this club in Milwaukee. They'll book that band and. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, the internet these days, you can do this stuff anywhere. Um, and there's, there's, there's other people doing awesome things here in, in like anywhere and you should like connect with them. And if you happen to be from like Oshkosh, Wisconsin, like Bonnie Bear, like he did well and he didn't even have that little community there, you know? Um, he won a Grammy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. A couple more questions here. Hi, Tom. Um, okay, so you're Tom Windish, agent, you have a roster, you work with the agents directly, but you're also, you put the Windish in the Windish agency, you have 80 people under you, right? So how do you get to do what you love, which is working one-on-one -on -one with these artists, but also growing an empire around you? Like, what's the organizational system, when do you know when to let go and grow? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I mean... Ooh, I, that was a good <laughs> one. Yeah. I've been doing this a long time now, so I'm, um, I kind of got my head out of the fog like maybe less than 10 years ago um, and realized like, wow, there's something, there's a business happening here and I was getting older and had, you know, made mistakes and learned from them and stuff. Um, we, we've dropped a lot of bands. Um, when I started talking to Paradigm like three years ago, uh, the main guy there said, uh, the one bad thing about you guys is you have way too many bands. We had 900 bands at that time. And I went back to all of our agents, uh, and over the course of two years, I figured out about 10 different ways to tell them that some of these bands you shouldn't be booking. Um, they haven't played shows in a couple of years. Nobody goes to see them. Um, the manager's a total jerk, and you're depressed because of it. <laughs> many, many different things. Um, I had never told them, like, drop anything, and then I did. Now we have 650. Uh, we dropped about 300. Um, I also let, like, five agents go. Um, I think most of the time, actually, when I was dropping the bands and, uh, and letting those people go, those agents go, they thanked me. And they were like, you know, the only reason I was still doing this was because, like, I had this kind of paycheck or, like, you, you know, you're bringing me offers that we were confirming, but my, like, heart wasn't into it anymore. You know, I was kind of, like, lost. Um, and those people are now doing other things and they're, they're way happier. Um, I don't know. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> I, think we, I think we got it. Okay, okay. All right, two more questions. So one right here. 
Hey, this question is for Naya. Um, what was the process of trying to discover your sound like? Because I know a lot of artists get caught up in the commerciality of things, which can totally hinder you know, someone like Tom wanting to hear the same thing over and over again when it's already been done. So how many different you know, genres did you dabble in? And how, what was the process of like trying to discover your originality? That's a really good question. Um, it was like hell, actually. It was, it's very hard, you know, and I think ultimately it's until you can start to hear your own gut or like your, your own head, you don't really know, you know. For me, I didn't have a clear vision of what I wanted my music to sound like, you know, and I have some friends that are artists that knew exactly what kind of music they wanted to make, and I knew what music I loved, but I didn't know what that, you know, turned into for my own original music. So it took a bunch of years trying with so many, you know, great people, but just not good fits, you know, good writers and great producers, but I just didn't, it didn't feel right, you know, and then suddenly, you know, I started to actually realize what I think I wanted by doing things I didn't like to do, you know, and you start to see a clear lane of like, okay, it's gonna be some of this, a little bit of that, and none of this, you know, but it takes a lot of time, and it can be really discouraging, because you know that it's not this, but you can't really figure out what it is, and throughout that whole process, you have, many people with opinions telling you what you're supposed to do or what they think you should be and it's really tempting to just listen to them and be like okay yeah you might know better and sometimes you know if you have the right team some people can really help develop what they think you know you should do and if you trust them it's worth taking that that risk and seeing if they have something to offer but ultimately it's like you got to you got to find it yourself and you'll know like the second it clicks you're like oh okay, this is, this is happening. But it might take a really long time or it might take like a month, you know, it's, it's just, but that's like, you know, enjoy the journey. That's kind of how, all I can say, but it is really hard, so. I, I think that like uh, the music, uh, music business or, or whatever, the music is at an incredible place today. The most incredible place in my entire life, career. I hear amazing things that my brain has never like conceived of before almost every day um, and that's incredible and the walls uh, that were up 15 years ago with the music business are like largely gone um, which is amazing um, definitely like now seize the day go for it do what you love I highly encourage you to do that I do think it's in also incredibly challenging because it goes to the point of like trying to find your voice and like what you're doing. You, like an artist will make, like they have their whole life or career to make these songs, they put them on the internet now, and like sometimes one of them sticks and a ton of people listen to it and freak out and then all this stuff starts happening and people start promising the world and giving you all these opinions and like when that happens, like everything kind of changes. Um, and it's very, very dangerous because you could get, I mean, you just get so lost. Um, so lost that you don't even like know, how did, you, how did like, we make that one song? Um, I've seen this with bands that have like blown up on the first record. They had you know, 20 years to make this first record. Who knows how long it took them, long time. They make an amazing record, it's huge. It sells a million copies. Then they go on tour for like two years. You know, they're on the road for two freaking years. <laughs> and then they're supposed to put out another record like right away. And they, so they do, because people are really pressuring them. And they put out a record that nobody likes. That happens like seven times out of 10 these days. And I really don't want that to happen to my clients. Um, so like, I don't really know what the solution is other than slowing down, being confident, doing what you love, listening to very few people, yeah. um, get rid of the chatter. And uh, you know, look at it much longer term than like, oh well, you know, Spin said we're great, so we have to have this like huge show at so and so, or why aren't we on that bill? My most popular song I started writing when I was 17 and finished it when I was 25. So it's yeah. it takes a lot of time to you know figure out what it is. So okay, one last question. The no, no one. 
No one's brave for the last. Hi. Second Thank you for last. coming, Tom and Naya. Um, so my question is, knowing or knowing that you feel that the music industry now is at a really great point, do you predict or see any, I guess, new development for an agency itself, I guess, in the future, like five years from now? Uh, what, what agencies do is changing dramatically. Um, I guess I've seen that for the last five, five or so years. I, I've added a person that does brand partnerships, a person that books corporate events, a person who books colleges. Um, I have a person that just works on special projects. And I have artists that have like lots of crazy ideas. Um, and they work with some of these people and make them happen. So we have people writing books. Um, we have people making television shows. We have people who are hosts of television shows. Um, I'm, one of the reasons I merged with Paradigm was so that we had a film and TV department. We have a theatrical department. Uh, they just launched uh, this, this Broadway sh musical Waitress with Sarah Borales, one of their clients. And I have clients that want to make Broadway musicals. Um, <laughs> Naya being one. <laughs> a agencies are, a lot more money is coming in um, on the live side than it used to. And a lot less is coming through on the recorded side. And record labels used to like, provide a lot of these extra services and direction um, and NR and they don't um, to a large extent and they have way more acts than they used to. So agencies are sometimes picking up the slack. One of the opportunities I see is uh, a lot of agencies are saying they can do this. You know, they represent some you know, huge actors and huge television people and they tell bands like, or musicians, we can do this for you, um, but they actually don't. Um, I want to be the agency that actually does. And it's only been eight months since we've done our, our deal with, with Paradigm, but we've already done book deals, television deals, a, a movie deal. I mean, we have Twin Shadow who's going to be in a James Franco movie. He's going to co-star in a James Franco movie. And I would not have been able to make that happen eight months ago. Um, so that's like, I guess, a change um, to be an agency that can actually provide all those other things. I think we'll see musicians with lots more ideas outside of just music um, that are viable and awesome and should be turned into something. And they will be. Um, and I want to be one of the places that makes that happen. OK, I'm sorry, Paisley. No, okay. You could be the last question. I just wanted to know what you're working on now, Naya. And like, can we find, are you touring? Can we find you? I'm finishing up my first album. So and after that, I think I'll be on a tour. I'm, pa I'm, I'm patiently waiting. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I have a question, and then we are going to actually go into transition. Nye's going to perform for us, which is amazing. Um, so what's on your playlist currently are you listening to? And you can only name, like, five bands, <laughs> dead or alive. Go Nia. Come Man. on, you can do it. I'm listening to old music always, but my manager loves all this like weird punk stuff. So I'm listening to this like small punk band called The Hunters that she manages to. And then who else? James Blake. You Nina like Simone. James Blake? Yes. Sade. It's pretty much Ooh, it. Ooh, nice. <laughs> That's all I usually listen to. We like it, Tom. Um, I just signed a band called Muna, M-U-N-A, from, from L.A. Um, these three women from USC, I'm uh, really into that band. Um, an artist called Leon, who's from Sweden. Um, she has a song, there's nothing out, and has 23 million plays of this one song on Spotify. It's kind of insane. Um, I'm, I'm obsessed by music. Uh, I'll, I'll hear something literally every day that someone sends, and I'll play it like 20 times. And I'll send it to all these people, They're like, check this out, what do you think, what do you think? And most of them are like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
seasons change and I tried hard just to soften you seasons change but I've grown tired trying to change for you Cause I've been waiting for you I've been waiting on you Yeah, you Cause I've been waiting on you I've been waiting for you The summer will warm And the winter will wash What's left of the taste As it breaks The summer will warm But the winter will wash What's left of the taste People change, you know, but some people, they never do. Ooh, and people change, yeah, they lose a piece, but they gain one too. Cause I've been waiting on you. I've been waiting for you, yeah, you, I've been hanging on you, da 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 I've been waiting for you, yeah, you, ooh, as it breaks. Summer will warm, but the winter will wash what's left of the taste. Ooh, as it breaks, the summer will warm. Yeah, but I wash away the taste. Seasons change Yeah, people change mm, They do, do, yeah da, na, 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 na. <laughs> Thank you Thank you Ain't no use in loving me Cause I always let you down Down Never knew what my heart was for Didn't know that it could feel So real I'm breaking in My heart's breaking now I'm breaking Oh, I'm breaking now Somehow 
No, you had to walk away. Cause I never behave like I should. Oh, I wish I could. Mm-hmm. Never thought I'd be the one to fall. Now my heart just sings the blues. Ooh, oh, those blues. Mm-hmm. I'm breaking. My heart's breaking now. I'm breaking. Oh, I'm breaking now. Somehow. Didn't we say for forever? Do I get back to where I was? Ooh, give me another chance, baby. Oh, I'm breaking. Yes, I'm breaking. Oh, oh, I'm breaking. My heart. It's breaking now. I'm breaking. Oh, I'm breaking now. Oh, somehow. Somehow. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you, Naya. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Josh.